recording. And um, as I turn on the recording, um, I'd like to um, welcome you again to the webinar on pain management. The presentation is by Dr. Tracy Speed, Assistant Professor of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Johns Hopkins. After the presentation, there will be plenty of time for questions. Please type, the, type them into the Q&A box on your screen, not the chat box, as I mentioned before. Um, and we will answer as many as we can today. Those that we don't answer, we will share with Jan Lynch, the nurse in our help center, and she will answer them and then and she'll consult with Dr. Speed or any other doctors that work with us um, as necessary. So now I'm going to pass the control over to Dr. Speed and she will take you through, um, through the presentation. Great, so, so can you hear me? I hear you and you share, you share your screen and we'll see your presentation then. All right. Mm -hmm. There you go. All right, does everyone see the slides? You're good. Okay. You're great. Great. So thank you so much for the opportunity to talk about pain today. And I will definitely leave enough time for questions. Um, and so we'll begin. So I've, uh, by the way, I have no financial disclosures at all for this talk. Um, so when we refer to pain, we are thinking about pain in two different ways. It's both a sensory experience uh, that has both, it's associated with a physical manipulation but it's also an emotional response to the distress and the anxiety that occurs with that pain. Um, and a lot of people ask why a psychiatrist is uh, in chronic pain research and clinical care and the emotional response is the exact reason as, as to why I have a role in this field. Um, and as you can see, Frida Kahlo has this picture called Without Hope. And she is the Mexican artist who had a very successful career uh, when she was younger, she suffered from polio and was also in a motor vehicle accident. So a lot of her um, artwork is related to her pain and her life. And I think this is a kind of a good depiction of what people with chronic pain may experience. So for the remainder of the talk, I'm going to be referring to chronic pain. And when I'm speaking of chronic pain, I either thinking of an ongoing pro uh, process that might be related to some type of tissue destruction. So maybe that's something like osteoarthritis, some type of chronic infection, or sometimes malignancy. But there's also other types of pain. And that's when there might be an acute injury to the body. And for kind of reasons that we don't always understand, somehow the nerves are changed so that they start registering that the body is constantly in pain. And that could happen to nerves in kind of our periphery, like our extremities or our body, as well as the nerves that go directly to our brain or are in our brain. So as researchers or clinicians, we often think about pain in terms of numbers or where it might be happening. So oftentimes when you go to a clinician or a provider, we ask what type of pain you're experiencing on a scale of zero to 10. And in some ways that kind of tells us what the intensity of your individual pain is, right? And on, in the research world, we use the terms hyperalgesia, which means greater pain. So that may be that something that normally causes some type of pain in someone with a chronic pain syndrome, that pain is really heightened or elevated. Or another term called allodynia, which means other pain. And that is when kind of a typical response that wouldn't cause pain suddenly can cause some type of severe response. And as you can see, we also are doing a lot of research about where uh, different regions of the brain that experience pain. But I like to remind patients that chronic pain is such an individual experience and it's more than just a number, it really is the kind of that experience overall. So in general, a lot of us might find that a feather lightly touching the skin is really comforting or soothing or maybe even ticklish, but someone with chronic pain might experience that as like a fiery, burny sensation and is not something that's pleasurable at all. And again, when we talk about pain, it's often 
related to some type of um, maladaptive signaling that's happening in the brain. So years ago, people used to say, oh, pain is all just in your head, kind of in a joking manner. And now we understand that pain really is in someone's head. Um, and we understand that pain is actually kind of a chronic disorder of the brain, and that there are many mechanisms that are related that um, from different regions of the brain that sense pain and give us an emotional response to pain and then send signals through our spinal cord to other parts of our body. So there's a small body of, of research in pain in Marfan syndrome. And this screen highlights two studies. Uh, one was done by a Dr. Nelson um, based out in Chicago. And she was one of the first people to show that pain is occurring kind of everywhere in the body in individuals with Marfan syndrome. So as you can see here, uh, back pain is kind of the, the most reported pain, but certainly people also have headaches, shoulder pain, joint pain, um, pegs in their, pain in their legs and their feet, um, as well as abdominal pain. And in general, individuals with Marfan syndrome will kind of report their pain on average about a five on a zero to 10 scale. So clinically, we think about that as kind of a moderate level of pain. Uh, and some of the work that I've done in the pain field was to kind of, again, characterize pain in individuals with Marfan syndrome. And in a survey that we had on the marfan.org website, we had out of the respondents, 89% said that pain is very common for them. Some other facts that we found out about individuals with Marfan syndrome is that for those who do report pain, uh, most people experience pain more than 50% of the time. Almost everyone says that they have sudden increases in their pain in addition to their baseline pain. Uh, and three quarters of people said that when pain is at its uh, worst, they would describe it as horrible or excruciating. Unfortunately, less than half of individuals who took the survey said that they were satisfied with their current pain management. Uh, and again, almost three quarters of individuals said that um, their pain never goes into remission or never goes away. And finally, there was only about 41% of um, people who said that their pain was actually like not diagnosed or not given a, a clear diagnosis. So why is it important to talk about pain? And for any individual that's experienced it, uh, one may understand that pain is really associated with so many other factors. And that can be a hopelessness, feeling that that pain may never go away, feeling demoralized, um, just chronic fatigue is very common with chronic pain. And from all of those symptoms, there can be further consequences over the long term, which can result in disability, isolation from family and friends, difficulty sleeping, sometimes using kind of drugs or alcohol inappropriately to cope with pain, and certainly difficulty adhering to kind of treatment recommendations, both with pain and with other medical problems as well. And um, in addition to those symptoms, pain certainly affects individuals' quality of life. So oftentimes individuals with chronic pain notice that their relationship with their spouse or their children or their friends may be different. They may have difficulty getting to school if you're young or adolescent, uh, may have difficulty oftentimes getting to work. So we know that there's clear data in Marfan syndrome that a lot of individuals have to go on disability or have early retirement due to their chronic pain or other quality of life issues. And of course, sports and kind of physical and mental health are also affected by chronic pain. So in some other research that, um, that I did with the survey on the Marfan website, uh, we kind of um, separated individuals by uh, when their pain started or how their pain was experienced throughout the course of their illness. So to the bar on the far left, which is kind of a, a middish color blue, that's all the patients um, or participants in the survey. And then the orange bars, the darker orange is that people who are reporting pain, the lighter green is showing the people who said that their pain started kind of at the beginning of when they had other symptoms of Marfan syndrome. And then the very light blue on the far right is for individuals that said that pain spread from one part of their body to additional parts of their body. And the main takeaway from these graphs is that individuals with pain those with pain at the onset of Marfan syndrome, 
as well as those who report kind of that the pain is spreading to other parts of their body from the initial site, tend to also report greater pain disability, kind of more worries about their pain, uh, and decreased physical health. Now, in general, um, all individuals report kind of some lower level of mental health quality of life that's lower than the national average. So the national average would be the, the black dotted bars there. And the lower scores mean kind of worse quality of life regarding physical and mental health. So, you know, uh, we all know that chronic pain is difficult. It has a lot of consequences and certainly affects one's quality of life. So the next question is, how do we address this and where do we begin? And as a clinician, when it comes to managing chronic pain, the first question is, what are we actually treating? So regarding pain, one thing to, that's important to consider is what is the actual pain disorder? Um, or what is the kind of origin of the pain? So is it because of some type of inflammatory condition? Is it mechanical in nature? Again, thinking about joint type or mobility or osteoarthritis or some type of disc that's uh, displaced in the spinal cord. Is it neuropathic pain, which is a way of saying that kind of the, your nerves in your extremities um, might be damaged and are causing some type of, of sharp pain? Um, or is there another type of pain disorder that's, a, that's um, causing the disorder? And then the other important things are to think about what are the other comorbidities? Because pain does not occur in isolation. It certainly is affected by kind of our depressive states, if we have high anxiety, um, if we're inactive, our body can become deconditioned and that can also affect our pain. So there are certain behaviors that we might engage in when we are experiencing pain. Um, sometimes we use alcohol or other type of drugs or medications to kind of alleviate the symptoms momentarily or to kind of ease that suffering. But sometimes use of those substances can cause further problems. And certainly we understand in pain that stress, grief, um, times of, of de demoralization can also exacerbate pain and make it worse. And kind of going along with thinking about all of those conditions, as a clinician, what we talk about is kind of formulating the diagnosis or formulating the individual's um, susceptibilities to pain. And when I say that, I mean that Again, an, indiv an individual is not someone that just is someone who has pain, but they're someone who's experiencing a lot of other things. So maybe there's a genetic vulnerability to pain. Maybe uh, there's certain life events that are triggering that pain. Maybe they're sleeping poorly and that's worsening the pain. And again, sometimes we have vulner vulnerabilities in life that can affect our pain. So as we're thinking about kind of the clinical assessment and what these diagnoses are that we want to treat, as well as the psychosocial factors that are affecting pain, the goals um, then become how to develop a targeted treatment plan that is unique to the individual and the individual's needs, and then to determine if other providers are needed to help manage the pain as well. And I like to remind all of my patients who I'm managing for chronic pain that when we're thinking about pain management, you know, there's no magic pill or no magic treatment that can make the pain go away completely. So the goals of pain management are not necessarily to remove that pain or eliminate it, but to figure out ways to improve functioning, improve quality of life, and kind of help with rehabilitation so that you can live the life that you want to live despite the pain. So this is another study that was conducted again by Dr. Nelson in Chicago. And this was a survey looking at what type of um, pain treatments are used in individuals with Marfan syndrome. And as you can see, both kind of medications or pharmacological treatment as well as non-pharmacological treatment are common for individuals with Marfan syndrome. And a third of patient or participants said that they were using some type of daily analgesic or pain medicine. Within the past week of survey completion, over 50% of people said that they had used some type of medicine. NSAIDs such as ibuprofen, Aleve, um, naproxen are still one of the most commonly used medications for pain. 
and uh, acetaminophen or Tylenol um, are also very commonly used. In terms of non-pharmacological management, individuals reported that physical therapy was something they had tried in the past, as well as massage. Warm compresses, uh, relaxation techniques, distraction, and the least utilized um, pain method in this survey was biofeedback. And then this is a subsequent uh, study, follow-up study that um, I completed with my colleagues at Johns Hopkins, where it was a smaller survey of only 218 people. Um, but essentially individuals did say that if you look at the, the percentages, most people were more likely to have tried different type of pain management um, and had tried more treatment strategies than they, they were currently using. And in terms of the most common treatments, again, over-the-counter treatments were the most common uh, currently reported at the time that people completed the survey by about uh, almost or over 50% of the population. Uh, opioids were also very common as well as kind of non-opioid pain medications. Uh, physical therapy is something that over half of people had tried at some point and only uh, just less than 20% were currently using at the time they completed the survey. Now, complementary and alternative medications have also been tried um, in about 37% of the population at some point, which is kind of consistent with the overall population, at least in the United States. Uh, and then finally, you can see that kind of, again, those non-pharmacological inter interventions, whether it would be having a psychologist or occupational therapist or some type of procedure, um, like a steroid injection or some type of uh, spinal cord stimulator, were used less frequently than any medications. Now, of course, we're in the middle of what we classify or call the opioid epidemic. And so this is currently a very hot topic for individuals with chronic pain. And as you can see by the, the picture here, there's enough opioid prescriptions have been written, and this data was from 2013, for every uh, American adult to have one pot, uh, bottle of, of opioid pills in their household. And what we've learned over the past 20 years from using opioids as kind of the first line treatment for pain is that there's really no uh, efficacy or kind of long-term value in using uh, opioids for individuals with chronic pain. And again, there's very limited research on kind of opioid use in Marfan syndrome. So this was um, some other data that we've recently published and this shows that of the patients who at the time of the survey said that they were currently using opioids, uh, those who were unemployed and those who had more Marfan symptoms, as well as those who had more locations of their pain, were more likely to be on opioids. Now, the survey was all self-report, so we did not look at medical records and everything was just based on what a patient was saying they were using. So this also wasn't necessarily something that was prescribed, but what patients said or individuals said that they were using. And consistent with the current literature for other chronic pain conditions, those individuals who are currently using opioids um, continue to report that their pain is more severe, more frequent, and more intense uh, than individuals who are not prescribed opioids. Now, this was again a cross-sectional survey and all self-report, so it's hard to draw a conclusion about long-term if opioids are making things worse or if people with worse pain are more likely to be prescribed opioids. Um, but it is some small data that suggests that we need to kind of understand more about um, the use of opioids in Marfan syndrome. Now, one of the important things to think about in pain management is, like I said before, there's not just one pill or one treatment strategy that can usually manage chronic pain. So it really does take a multimodal approach. And when I use the word multimodal, I mean many different types of therapies. So uh, medications or pharmacotherapy can certainly play a role. And uh, you know, as we showed, are very common in individuals with Marfan syndrome. There's also interventional approaches, such as injections or spinal stimulators. Oftentimes, uh, psychological support like psychotherapy or family therapy can be really helpful for pain. And then of course, rehabilitation. So physical therapy, 
using certain type of graded exercise programs or other devices that can help with rehabilitation can be really important. And there's more and more research that's being done in general in chronic pain about complementary and alternative medicines, um, thinking about like massage and acupuncture, where there's you know, some small body of evidence that they can be helpful in managing chronic pain. So when thinking about medications, um, there's lots of different ways to target pain. And again, oftentimes individuals with chronic pain are experiencing pain because of different signaling pathways in their body. And there's probably multiple areas where there's pain. So that could be signaling from the brain and that could be signaling from the tissue area itself. So in order to address pain, I like to think about it as kind of you're carrying your bucket of water. Right? And if you happen to be the soul that has the, the bucket with a lot of holes in it, you can't just put a Band-Aid on one of those holes and expect the water to stay in the bucket. Right? You need to address every single hole. And that's how I think about pain management as well, is it oftentimes takes a variety of medications that are targeting different pain pathways in our body to be able to effectively manage pain. And so sometimes those medications are what fall into the class of antidepressants or anticonvulsant medications, but are really targeting the pain pathways in the brain. Uh, sometimes they're local anesthetics. Sometimes they're medications that can uh, affect our heart rate and our sympathetic nervous system. And sometimes they're anti-inflammatory medicines. And the first line treatments, in addition to the over-the-counter treatments when they're appropriate, that I tend to use for pain are medications that we call neuromodulators. And that's a fancy word for saying that there's medications that will modify the nerve signal. So for chronic pain patients, we're usually trying to decrease the inappropriate nerves from firing and to stop sending their pain signals um, and enhance the healthy signals. So we do that by prescribing different medicines, which again, oftentimes fall under the class of antidepressant medications or anti-seizure medications, but are oftentimes prescribed for chronic pain. And so medications here like the SNRIs or tricyclics, um, these are medications that are known to help with migraine and other pain conditions. And of course, we uh, definitely need to focus on non-pharmacological approaches to manage pain as well. And again, a lot of it's about kind of educating about how these um, approaches can help manage pain. And sometimes it's important to remind ourselves that the pain may get worse before it actually gets better. That anything that becomes a long-term process or a chronic process that we need to commit to it and continue to strive to the goal that we do want to set short-term expectations, but oftentimes we have to think about long-term goals. And I can't reiterate enough, there's that concept that the pain may never go away completely, but how do we still um, get individuals with pain to feel uh, well enough to, again, engage in the activities that they want to. And often in order to do that, we need a team. So just like our superheroes these days are fighting their arch nemeses uh, using groups and people with different skill sets, we need to think about that same kind of approach in managing chronic pain. So oftentimes our primary care physicians are the people who are kind of that first line provider who are managing the pain. Um, and for those people who are lucky enough to have access to kind of other specialists, certainly there are chronic pain specialists, usually these are anesthesiologists, there are um, psychiatrists around the country who do understand kind of the interaction of mood and chronic pain and can be helpful. There's a special specialty called physical medicine and rehabilitation, um, which is short, the shorthand being PMNR. And these are physicians who kind of excel in understanding how muscles move and are connected to each other and oftentimes can help with kind of local injections or do physical therapy techniques for patients. There's the blossoming field of integrated medicine, which again includes complementary and alternative techniques. And then there's other clinical providers like psychologists, occupational therapists, um, therapists that specialize in group or family therapy. And then, you know, as the data showed, a lot of individuals use physical therapy. 
Now, I like to remind patients, especially with conditions that are like connected tissue disorders or joint hypermobility disorders like Marfan syndrome, that it's important to find a physical therapist who understands what chronic pain is and that it's not going to be alleviated with six weeks of acute pain therapy. So it's someone who can help kind of build uh, an exercise regimen around strengthening the muscles without worsening joint hypermobility. And I also ask patients to kind of collect a toolbox of different tricks and different therapies because there's times when one approach may be really effective and then there's another time when the pain is really severe or something else is going on in life and maybe that typical approach isn't helpful. And so that's when you can try a different strategy to help manage the pain. And among these different strategies, we have behavioral approaches, as well as relaxation, um, and again, different recovery exercises. And the data supports using these types of techniques uh, for individuals who are experiencing anxiety, depression, um, headaches, or musculoskeletal pain, and stress. So my personal favorite approach to managing chronic pain is a technique called cognitive behavioral therapy. And for those who are unaware of that, it is a therapy that is revolved around the idea that our thoughts, our feelings, and our behaviors are all connected and intertwined. So when we feel some way, we might think and do something, and if we behave a certain way, that can affect our thoughts and feelings. And the reason I really um, prefer to start with CBT is because oftentimes patients or individuals really understand that there's things that kind of prohibit us for, from doing or achieving our goals, right? So oftentimes it's our feelings. And we may say, I don't feel like going to the gym today, or I don't feel like going to that appointment today, but I'll, maybe I'll do it tomorrow. And unfortunately, sometimes our feelings can, can guide us um, however, if we just choose to do things a certain way, oftentimes our feelings and our thoughts about that will change and will be modified by engaging in that. So, you know, an example would be going to physical therapy a few times a week. If that's something that someone has, has recommended to do, even if you don't feel like it, the more you do it, the better you'll, um, you'll start to feel afterwards. And of course, relaxation definitely has a role in chronic pain. So different relaxation strategies include kind of guided imagery. And the overall arching theme of relaxation is to help um, consciously kind of alleviate the, the body's state of mind. So that might involve breathing more slowly um, with the intent of trying to lower the blood pressure and, and starting to feel a sense of calm or well-being overall. And the nice thing about relaxation is it can be self-taught through modules on the internet or through self-help books um, or through going to a class somewhere. And there's a small part, subset of the population, at least in the US, um, that does engage in some form of relaxation regularly. So in terms of research, unfortunately, there's no specific studies in Marfan syndrome about which techniques may be best. But in general, if we think about chronic pain patients, we know that relaxa relaxation training um, is efficacious for musculoskeletal pain. And then other techniques such as yoga and mindfulness have been shown to help reduce inflammation. Interestingly and exciting, um, new studies are showing that mindfulness is able to actually change the networks in our brain, including hopefully like the pain signaling networks. It can improve anxiety symptoms, may be able to help with sleep, and um, there's emerging literature that these types of mindfulness practices might have some neuroprotective effects. And I, I typically recommend to patients to practice these techniques in combination, again, with other therapies, because none of these strategies are gonna be the, the, uh, the holy grail. The other important thing is to practice during a time when your pain is relatively low so that you can kind of understand how to practice that technique when you're not really stressed. As I pointed out earlier, biofeedback is a technique that um, is less commonly used. 
And that might be due to kind of lack of education about it as well as lack of availability. But for those people who might be able to have access to a therapist or physical therapist um, or a chronic pain specialist who understands biofeedback, it's a really interesting process in which we kind of take the process that our heart rate, our body temperature and such are, are physiological measures that oftentimes we think we can't change. However, if you were able to apply an instrument to your skin or to the chest, like if you're getting an EKG to look at your heart function or look at your breathing, you can start to understand how kind of trying to feel calm or trying to change your breathing might actually be able to change your physiological activity so that it becomes more voluntary. And over time, as you're learning these slight nuances in order to change your breathing or change your temperature, your body starts to kind of memorize those techniques as well. And so while you might need to go to a specialty center to kind of learn how to do biofeedback initially, eventually it's something that you can continue to practice at home over time by yourself. Of course, something that's more straightforward is just deep breathing itself. And to be honest, most patients I talk to in clinic about using deep breathing for relaxation tell me that it's not always really helpful. And part of it may be that we as providers don't take enough time to explain how to do deep breathing properly. And sometimes, again, if we're practicing it during times when it's extreme pain or extreme stress, it might um, be more difficult to kind of learn and accept. But deep breathing is really about taking a time to take a really deep breath and then exhaling that breath through your mouth and you know, hopefully putting a hand on your back and your abdominal muscles so that you can kind of feel that difference as you're breathing. And another strategy is progressive muscle relaxation. And this strategy involves kind of tensing and then relaxing the muscles, progressing uh, throughout the body. And I usually ask patients to start with their feet and to clench their feet um, to make them really tense for about 10 seconds and then to take a slow deep breath um, and release that muscle that they're currently clenching for the next about 20 seconds. And then you keep kind of moving up the body and clenching different muscle groups until you finally get to your face. And this is again something that it takes practice to understand kind of how to do it and if it's something that you might find useful. Um, but if you continue to practice it during times when you're not in excruciating pain, it, it can be a helpful tool in that toolbox. So lastly, I just want to also mention that self-efficacy is really important. And that's that belief that when you're investing in your, your own care and you're investing in your own rehabilitation, um, that it can be easier to accomplish those tasks. And an important part of thinking about chronic pain is to really think about what helps us to be well and to do well. And oftentimes in life, those are things that include social relationships, work, romantic relationships, um, being proud of finances, and then thinking about what our self image is. And these again can be challenging when we're dealing with chronic pain, but there are things that can really help us to think about being well. So overall, again, the goal in chronic pain is usually to think about rehabilitation. And that's ways to think about how you can intervene in, in your life um, in terms of occupational, social, or physical ways. It's to modify our behaviors so that we're doing things that are more helpful rather than harmful for our bodies. And when I say prescribe a new program, I oftentimes like to remind patients that if things aren't working, we need to try something new and try something different. So with that said, I'm just gonna end with a few final thoughts. And that is that pain is real and each individual's pain experience is unique. And that's why we have to understand uh, who a patient is and what their pain is like so that we can provide each individual with structure, hope, and advocacy. Um, and overall, that goal is, again, to be able to function despite the pain. So thank you for your attention. I'm happy to start answering some questions. Actually, we're going to, let me just take the remote back from you. We have a couple more things oh, we're yes. going to talk about before we do that. Uh, you guys can. Does that work? Um, let's see. 
Yes, I want to do that. Okay. So you guys can see my, can you guys see my screen now? I believe you can. Tracy, um, Tracy you can see my screen, right? Yes. Okay. So I just wanted to um, take one second and just talk about backpack health in one, one minute because, um, you know, there's so much more that needs that we need to know about pain and Marfan syndrome and other connective tissue disorders. And, um, you know, one way we can do that is to find out that information is through Backpack Health, which is an app that we have made available to all of you for free. Um, and it can benefit you and it can um, help benefit research. So as you see here, the app provides a way for you to safely and securely keep your health records and the health records for your whole family in one place. And so if you have a condition like Marfan, then that's a lot of records. So this is really helpful in that way. But just getting, I wanna really focus on the, how this helps advance research, which is needed in, um, in pain. So as you see here, so, um, so, you know, a lot of times you, want, you wonder, you know, what's the relationship between Marfan and pain? Is it derelictasia? Is it what's with the joints and pain and, and what works best? And Dr. Speed went over a lot of what's known um, and then also mentioned some things that aren't known. Um, so with Backpack Health, if once your information is in here and you, you agree that your information can then be included in the registry portion of this, first thing we do is take away any de-identifying information so it can never be traced to you. But then once all your information is in, then researchers who are going to be asking those questions, wanting to get the, the information that they can analyze to see what works and what doesn't work and what correlations are there, they'll be able to have a body of patients to draw from and have the information they need to actually look at some of those questions that you all want to know about pain and Marfan, pain and Ehlers-Danlos, pain and other connective tissue disorders. Um, so here's a quick little screen about how to join the registry. I don't want to take any more time by talking about it, but the link will be in the email that you'll get with the link to this recording as well. Um, it is a great tool, and I do hope that you all will take advantage of it. So let me go to the questions, because I know that there are some questions popping up here. Um, so let's see. Um, so here's a question about um, something called curcumin to manage pain. Are there any recent studies on it and its effects on our vascular system? Any concerns with that? Is that a medication that you're familiar with, Dr. Speed? So I'm familiar with it. Um, it is more kind of in that complementary and alternative realm. Um, so what I would say is any of the animal studies that are done um, that show that it might help reduce inflammation, they're using much higher doses than anything that we would um, consume as uh, humans. And mm -hmm. in terms of kind of the supplements out over the counter, we just don't have enough research studies to really say what the long-term effects would be. So that's one of those examples that if people are putting in their information into backpack health, once we get enough on certain things, doctors can then look at it. Yeah, um, so I got a lot of questions. supplements, it's important to put that in your record. Exactly. A lot of the questions I got ahead of time from people um, who were registering was about the use of cannabis and cannabis oil. So if you could just talk about that for a minute, because I'm sure people want to hear your opinion. Sure. So again, the short answer is that we just don't have any long-term data on any of the cannabinoid products or oils or um, marijuana products for chronic pain. So there's a few studies looking at kind of acute pain. So that's over the course of weeks or months and in individuals with peripheral neuropathy. Um, and so some people have extrapolated that marijuana or cannabinoids may be helpful for chronic pain, but we just don't know. And another thing to consider is the products that are currently on the market just are not FDA regulated at this point. Okay, great, thank you. Um, here's a question about managing chronic pain in children with Marfan syndrome. Um, what are the best practices or what do you recommend to, to the younger population? So definitely education about pain um, is key at a young age as well as kind of maintaining physical activity. So helping um, kids or adolescents understand like what activities they can engage in that aren't gonna be um, worsening their joint hypermobility. Um, and a lot of providers are scared to use medications in children or adolescents, um, but medications can still play a role in that population. And if, if it's possible to seek out a provider who feels more comfortable, I think that's always important. Great, thank you. Um, how about peripheral neuropathy? 
Um, is that, do you consider that a pain problem? I am a little bit familiar with it. Um, is it more common in Marfan or is it something that um, a lot of people complain about who have Marfan syndrome? Yeah, so peripheral neuropathy, it's definitely in the chronic pain disorders. Um, most people think about it who have kind of diabetes or vitamin deficiencies. Right. But certainly um, in Marfan's, it is more common because of um, discs that can slip, slip in the spinal cord and or kind of osteoarthritis and, and those types of things that can affect our peripheral nerve. So it is more common in Marfan syndrome. And generally, again, the anti-seizure medicines or what we call nerve medications can be helpful if you can tolerate it. Okay, great. Um, I also had some questions ahead of time about um, treating pain for dural ectasia in the Marfan population. So can you comment on that? Sure. Unfortunately, another area where there is very limited research. So these are all reasons that we need to keep doing chronic pain research. Um, but the few studies that are there are either case reports um, or just small studies. And imaging is always really important. Um, which if you're asking about dural ectasia means you probably have already had that, but for someone who might have kind of headaches or other things in Marfan syndrome, it's important to rule out dural ectasia. And then the, the, the least invasive strategy is to rest and stay hydrated. Then the next step would be to think about medications that typically are used for chronic pain, uh, like nortriptyline or Depakote or things that can be helpful for migraines. And then the next step would be to do something more invasive, possibly um, like doing a patch. Um, and that would involve t talking to an orthopedic surgeon and or a neurosurgeon. Okay, great. Um, here's another question about children. Is there any evidence to show that physical and occupational therapy can help children, particularly preteens, avoid, de avoid developing pain? That's a different, different kind of question. Yeah, so to my knowledge, there's no studies that kind of being proactive can help um, prevent pain. However, it's still, if it's a resource that's available, I still think it's something that can be useful because um, especially occupational therapists um, can be really helpful about having, like learning to manage or learning how to like have techniques to manage pain. Okay, okay. Um, let's see, the questions are coming in. Um, okay, somebody, so they just started taking tramadol and receiving steroid shots in their shoulders, hips, and lower back. Is this common? So both of those uh, strategies are going to be very common. Tramadol does fall under the class of opioids, um, and so still has the same risks and or benefits as other types of opioids. And then steroid injections are very common. Um, and that's a, that's a reason to see a chronic pain specialist or an anesthesiologist. And usually you can do injections maybe at max every three months. Um, but oftentimes if you've seen some benefit from one, then a physician would wanna keep repeating that for a while. Okay, great. Um, let me see. Okay, so here's somebody asking about complex physical comorbidities. I don't think that's a pain question. So we are, not be able to address that here. It's about more about a Marfan workup and diagnosis. So um, we'll address that to you separately. That's James that asked that. So we'll get back to you separately on that. Um, trying to think of some of the other questions that we had about, about pain that um, came in ahead of time. Um, if anybody else has any other questions that they would like to ask in here, um, you know, anything about anything practically that they could use or um, questions about, you know, you know, where do you, where do you start? I mean, if you, you know, what's the first doctor that you'd go to, Dr. Speed, if you have, if you're, you have Marfan, you have, you have related disorder, and, you know, you have all your different specialists that you're going to, but, and, and the pain just interferes with your quality of life. So who's, who's the first person that you go to, which of your doctors, and, and what do you say to kind of get their attention that you so, really need some help? Yeah, I always think it's important to start with your primary care physician. Um, to let them know what you're experiencing, what the pain is like, um, and to be honest and open, um, and hopefully have a discussion about more than just a pain scale, but really how that pain is affecting your quality of life. Mm -hmm. And then unfortunately, kind of given so many factors in today's medical world, uh, primary care doesn't always have time to really spend a lot of time working up the chronic pain, and that's why they may be able to refer to a neurologist, um, if there's psychiatrists who understand chronic pain or anesthesiologists. 
um, those are kind of some of the first specialists to go to, um, as well as orthopedic surgeons, um, if they think that there's something um, that can be operated on. And then psychologists, uh, it, there's a growing field of pain psychology um, and, and clinical providers who kind of understand different psychotherapy techniques, whether it's cognitive behavioral therapy or acceptance commitment therapy or interpersonal relations. Uh, so those can all be strategies of people to talk to. Yeah, it's a lot of people are asking about how you find the right doctor. I mean, you know, I, you know, a lot of people think, you know, if you're going to go to a surgeon and ask, their answer is going to be surgery. So how do you, how do you ask the right questions and find the right doctor who, who is going to be um, neutral about whether it's, you know, um, psychological kind of approaches or um, medication kind of approaches or surgical kind of approaches, like, what, and what kind of questions do you ask and, and what, what are you listening for? to make a determination if that's a doctor that you want, that you can feel like you can be able to work with and get some results. Yeah, so I think to be reasonable and to be honest, most of us who specialize in a particular field are gonna be more prone to suggest that treatment strategy. So surgery right, I know. Are, yeah. are going to usually recommend surgery. Um, but I think questions to ask are, is again, like how will this affect my quality of life in the future? Um, and not just what are their outcomes from surgery, kind of in the immediate sense, but how well are people functioning? And I think it's important just do you feel like you can connect to that physician or clinician and, and are they um, someone you feel comfortable with? Uh, and then especially I think for Marfan syndrome, is it someone who actually understands all of the different factors of Marfan syndrome? Right. Because right. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty unique disease or disorder, so. Yeah. Um. Yeah, that's, that's hard sometimes. You, know, you, you find the local chronic pain doctors, but then they don't, never had a Marfan patient before. So that right. makes it, that makes yeah. it difficult. Definitely um, in certain areas of the country and world, it can be really hard to do what I'm suggesting. <laughs> exactly, I know, it's, it is really hard. And for anybody listening, so we have a, a list of institutions um, on our website that, does have, that, that do specialize in Marfan. You can ask them about doctors they work with on pain. Um, and also Jan Lynch in our help center has lists of other doctors that are not connected to those particular institutions that might be, um, might be helpful. Um, so here's another question about, um, about migraine pain. And they said that, okay, they said that the doctor helped, the neurologist was helpful. So that's great. How about in the correlation between Marfan and an intolerance to chemical solutions? You know, some of the medications that you've mentioned. So the individual. It, you know, there's no, there's actually no study on any of these analgesic or pain medicines that I've been referring to. I will say, mm -hmm. having now gone to the Marfan Foundation Conference for a couple of times, that there's a fair amount of patients that say, you know, I, I don't have a good reaction to something like gabapentin or Neurontin or Lyrica. Um, and what we really need to do is, is have clinical research trials to see if, if that is something that's true and to understand why. Um, and so I kind of mention a lot of the different medications that are available, but of course every medication needs to be prescribed in consultation with a physician. Um, and hopefully one day we'll, we'll have more you know, research understanding of what medications are more specific for Marfan syndrome. You know, you mentioned earlier about the opioid epi epidemic, and of course, I mean, there are particular uses for it, and then there's overuse or, and misuse. Um, you know, people are worried, and there's a question here, and it's not about, op it's about, you know, variety of medications that you might be on, and, you know, you don't, you want to take what's prescribed, yet you, you're afraid of getting addicted, and, you know, you don't want it to lead to stronger drugs that you might need or illicit drugs, so you know, how do you, you know, responsibly use the medications for the right amount of time so you're not overusing them or it's not leading to something worse down the road? You know what I mean? Yeah, uh, it's a really good question. Um, if someone is, has never taken an opioid before and then gets that prescription, we know that taking a, an opioid for about three to seven days max is safe without really much risk of any type of addiction um, and can help acute pain. And that there are some individuals who can be kind of on, on lower dose opioids and it really helps their, their pain. And my rule of thumb is if you're taking up medication and you're actually able to function and do the things you want to do, like go to work, your relationships are stable, things, then maybe that medication is appropriate. 
Um, but if you start to notice that you're kind of constantly seeking an earlier appointment or using more of these medications than the doctors recommended, um, that it's causing really bad sedation or fatigue or other side effects, um, or you're starting to spend a lot of time thinking about like needing that medication, that those might be signs that it would be important to, to taper off that medication. What, and what about if you're also taking like an antidepressant or an anti-anxiety medication at the same time? Like, is, is, that something to, is that something to worry about? In general, no. Um, if, you're, if we're thinking about anti-anxiety medicines um, like benzodiazepines, so clonopin, Xanax, Ativan, some of those medicines, so that in combination with opioids can be very dangerous because the combination can decrease our respiratory rate, and that's why people tend to be at increased risk of overdose. Um, the other antidepressants have less of a risk of that and are not addictive. So I oftentimes have patients on multiple antidepressant therapies, um, but you know I feel comfortable with the pharmacology of those medications. Um, so it's okay to take more than one medicine, but you don't wanna do them when they're uh, gonna increase your risk of overdose. Great, thank you for that explanation. That was really great. Um, then here's a question that's a little bit different than exact medications. Um, somebody wants to know, how can she better explain to her family or friends when she has to cancel plans due to pain? You know, saying I'm not feeling well seems to be getting old. So, you know, you see this online all the time when people are talking about chronic pain and how to explain it to people and how to, how to get on with their daily life, but sometimes you just can't. And so what's the best way to, to tell people that, you, you know, what's really going on? It's a good question. And it... Um... Some of it is about how comfortable you feel with letting people know about your medical conditions and what the experience is like. Um, so you know, I recommend if you like, want to explain what that pain feels like or how it affects your, your energy level or your fatigue or your anxiety, that people might understand it more than just like, oh, I'm in pain. Um, and the other is to kind of always have a plan. So if, whether it's going to a family event or a birthday party or something, to kind of already have a, a preset plan as to how you might have to either leave early or um, have an excuse um, to have to not attend that party. Um, so instead of worrying about it, just kind of be more prepared for it. Great, thank you. I'm, I'm going back to steroids now. Um, somebody's asking if steroidal shots are contraindicated with connective tissue disorders. Are so in general, they're not, um, and we, have, I see a lot of patients with different types of connective tissue disorders who receive steroid injections. Again, it's something to talk in consultation with your physician about. Um, okay, okay. I mean, all of these things definitely are anyway. Yeah. And these are all ideas. Um, um, how about pain after surgery? So pain after surgery is common. Um, in one of my jobs, I actually work in a, a post-operative clinic where we're addressing acute on chronic pain. So again, that might be a time when opioids are appropriate for that acute pain management um, mm -hmm. and or other strategies and, uh, and using other medications. Um, there's a lot of evidence, too, that sleep disrupts pain and sleep is going to be disrupted after surgery. So those are important kind of things to think about and using behavioral techniques to make sure you're sleeping well. Um, and we're seeing kind of for people with chronic pain that it often takes about three to six months um, for that kind of acute pain to go away. So it's, it's a little bit about patience as well as kind of keeping up with right. the physical therapy and, the, and, the, and muscle strengthening. Great, all right, thank you. Thank you for answering so many questions. I know we have a few more to go, but we're running out of time. So I'm going to, um, I'm just going to move on and kind of close this out. And um, first, thank you, Dr. Speed, for, for taking an hour and um, presenting to us and answering all these questions. As I mentioned before, Jan Lynch, the nurse in our health center, um, is going to help answer the rest of these with Dr. Sp Dr. Speed when she needs her and, and other doctors as needed as well. Um, our next webinar is um, on Monday. I'm sorry. Our next, our next webinar in the um, in this empowerment series is November 27th, and that's on handling grief. And that is with um, Susan Leshin, who's a licensed social worker, and Jen Lynch, the nurse in our help center. And so that is 
a lot of people have been asking about this, and it's not, it's about grief on all different topics, whether it's a loss of your health, loss of a person, you know, loss of your, your dreams, whatever it is, they're going to help with that and give you some practical advice. So thank you all again for, um, for listening in tonight. Um, we're always open to your suggestions for future topics, and you can reply to the email that you'll be getting in the next couple of days. So thank you again, everybody. And um, have a great night. And thank you, Dr. Speed. And hopefully I'll see you soon. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody.